Good morning. Welcome here. It is good to see you this morning, good to hear people's voices visiting, and good for those who are joining us online also for you to be joining us. There are just two announcements I'd like to highlight at this time. One is uh, something that's been said a few times, but we're looking at, uh, we're inviting anybody who's interested in transferring their membership to our church to come talk to one of the pastors if that's something you're interested in or thought about or have questions about. We're planning to do a service a membership transfer sometime in the spring. So that's just another invitation. And if you want to know more about that, please come talk to us. The other thing is that uh, on February 27th will be our church's AGM. That'll be Sunday afternoon. The report books have been emailed to you with the bulletin last Friday. If you want your own copy, you can come by the church office to pick it up. And more details about some logistics around that will come out in the next week or so, but next uh, February 27th, Sunday afternoon. And I also want to acknowledge this morning the various types of sharing that happens within our worship services. We as pastors obviously read and pay attention to other people's words and writings on our scriptures and various theological ideas as we prepare our sermons. When worship leading, we also have several resources and prayers at our disposal to read for inspiration and also for duplication in some parts. This morning, I want to recognize the work and prayers of Carol Penner as an inspiration for my prayers this morning. She's a Mennonite pastor and also a professor of theology at Conrad Grable University College in Waterloo. And also as residents on this land, we also acknowledge that we are all Treaty One people, along with the Métis, Cree, First Nations, and Anishinaabe people. And as Treaty people, we strive to find ways to be in right relations with all people and with all of God's creation. So at this time, let us now turn our attention to song and lift our voices in praise of God. We will join together in singing Mountain of God.
Our call to worship this morning is taken from Job 37. For now, to the snow, God says, fall on the earth, and to the rain shower, turn into a heavy downpour. All human activity comes to a standstill so that everyone may acknowledge God's power. By the breath of God, ice is given, and the broad waters are frozen fast. From Job 37, a reminder that snow and winter, ice and storms also come under God's command. Let us pray. God of hope, in this snowy season, we turn our minds to worship. With thankfulness, we sing praises. With thoughtfulness, we listen to your scriptures. With trust, we put ourselves in your hands. In this service, through your creative power, draw us closer to one another, closer to you, and form us as your people, faithful in every season. Amen. We'll now sing together the song Holy. your time. Come on down. Kristen has a story for you. And as you're coming down, we're going to join our voices to sing the first verse of I Am the Bread of Life. Afterwards, we'll sing them out with verse 5. for you for right now. I want you to take it and I want you to look at it. All right. Everybody gets one. One for Maida, one for Cora, one for Natalie. Can you pass that to Natalie, Hannah? Thanks. Here's one for you, my dear. And one for Leah. And last but not least, one for Emma. Okay. Let's look at our paper. What do you notice? It's white. It's, it's white. white. It's blank. It's empty? Yeah. There's, there's, it's good? <laughs> it, pardon me? It's big. It, it, this mine is big, isn't it? 
So we're going to wing it a little bit today because I didn't actually get done what I wanted to this morning. But, so big blank paper, right? So, you know, every picture and every story starts with a blank page just like this one. Nothing's on it, and it's yours, right? You can do whatever you want on it. You could write a story, you could draw a picture, you could put stickers on it, you could just make big scribbles all over it, you could color it all one color, you could do all sorts of colors, you could make it a pattern, you could do whatever you want, right? You could create a monster. You could do whatever you wanted. You could imagine a whole new animal if you wanted, right? Whatever you want, you can do with that paper. You could write... You could even use words to do all of those things instead of colors and pictures. So that is exactly what it looked like when God sat down to create the earth, the universe, and everything in it. He started with a blank page, just like this one. <coughs> well, actually, there wasn't even a page. Just darkness and nothing. And God, too, of course. So then he started to create, and it was exactly what he wanted. He put the planets into space. He put the stars in the sky and made the galaxies and, the un and all the galaxies in the universe. So I found some pretty amazing pictures yesterday while I was looking. <coughs> God's creativity is pretty amazing. Who else could think of a long-necked, spotted giraffe like this guy? Hey, who else could think to put the big roar of a lion into his mouth and the little purr? into the little kitty's mouth. Hey, who else could think of... Look, look at these crazy things that we found. A stick bug. Or what about these crazy looking... Or a sloth that hardly ever comes out of the trees. Or, look at this one. This is a cool little fish that we discovered yesterday. It's called a leafy sea dragon. It doesn't look anything like a giraffe. It's totally new. And look at this guy. This, he's called a mantis shrimp. We didn't know about him either. God's creativity is like endless. He could come up with all sorts of things and then still come up with more. Isn't that cool? <clears throat> the coolest thing about God's endless creativity is that he used that creativity to make each of you too. Each of you is unique. You each have your own story. And God has already started writing that story in his book. And it's going to be special, and it's going to be uniquely you. So, you've got your paper. I want you to create something. Whatever you want on that paper. But I also want you to remember that God made you to be just you, just the way you are. And he loves you because you're perfect to him just the way you are. Let's pray. Lord, the whole universe shows your creativity. I trust that you are creating a wonderful story in each of us. Amen.
The first scripture reading this morning is taken from Psalm 74, verses 13 to 17. You divided the sea by your might. You broke the heads of the dragons in the waters. You crushed, you crushed the heads of Leviathan. You gave him as food for the creatures of the wilderness. You cut openings for springs and torrents. You dried up ever-flowing streams. Yours is the day, yours also the night. You established the luminaries and the sun. You have fixed all the bounds of the earth. You made summer and winter. And from Acts 17, verses 22 to 28. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by, hum nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he had lauded the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live, so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far off from each of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said. For we too are his offspring. The topic of the relationship between theology and science, between Christian beliefs and science, between our knowledge of God and our knowledge of nature. It's a timely topic. It's an important topic uh, because the stakes are high. If we perceive science and Christian faith to be inherently in tension or in conflict. There are a number of implications to this, implications which I believe are quite negative. One is that we may, as, as Christians, be hostile to science, to the knowledge that science gives us, and uh, to resist things uh, that may be necessary for us to do and may help us. The valuable contributions that science makes may be lost. On the other hand, if they are perceived to be in conflict or in tension, people who love science, scientists, people who value uh, this type of knowledge and inquiry might think that they have to reject faith because of science. 
And people may lose the opportunity, the joy of knowing the Lord and living a life of faith. And that also is a great loss. My argument today is that if we understand God rightly, then there is no conflict between science and Christian beliefs. Or to put it the other way around, if we perceive that Christian convictions and a life of faith and science are in conflict, then that is a symptom, a sign that we have not, in fact, understood the nature of God. The love of science does not eliminate the love of God, nor does the love of God mean there is, can be no love of science. Contrary to what is often assumed, the church has, on the whole, made a very positive contribution to the development of science. Uh, when the Roman Empire fell and Europe uh, descended into what has sometimes pejoratively been called the Dark Ages, um, that's not a fair characterization, but it is true that much science and learning was lost during this time. And throughout, but throughout the Middle Ages, it was often monasteries and monks, institutions of the church, that preserved the writings and the knowledge uh, of science that the ancients possessed. And it was monks who carried out research, and it was the church who founded schools and universities and hospitals, institutions of learning about nature and the world. Eventually, theology came to be understood as the queen of the sciences. Theology is the queen of the sciences. Like science, theology is, is an inquiry, seeking knowledge, seeking understanding. But unlike science, theology seeks knowledge and understanding of God, something reality, the nature of God, which transcends the natural world around us. And so theology require different methods, different awareness than mathematics or physics or biology. Hence, theology is the queen of the sciences. And it was this very understanding that God had created the world, which was often the impetus for people to study nature and to seek out the laws that governed nature and life, and to understand what it was, how it is that this creation worked. Never was it thought that by understanding more about nature, that that would in any way infringe upon the sovereignty of God or the understanding that God was the creator. But there have been moments of conflict between science and the church. And one of the most famous examples was when, as a result of several uh, developments, one being the invention of the telescope and the research of astronomers like Copernicus and Kepler, eventually a scientist by the name of Galileo published his research indicating that in fact the earth revolved around the sun. Uh, prior to this development, it was understood that the earth was at the center of the universe and the sun and the stars revolved around the earth. 
And this suggestion was very concerning to many people. It was, it, it was threatening for the church at the time because if the earth was not at the center of the universe, it was thought that this meant God hadn't created humanity uh, as a special part of creation. Something was unsettled in, in the church's understanding of creation. Well, today we do not have this conflict, and we accept, we know that the earth is not the center of the universe, and that in fact uh, the earth is one planet orbiting one star in an outer branch of the Milky Way galaxy among billions of stars in our galaxy among billions of galaxies in the universe. And if anything, this inspires awe and wonder about the power and the sovereignty of God, not tension or conflict. This tension, though, has been felt again as science has put forth research indicating that our universe is about 14 billion years old and that it originated uh, in so-called Big Bang, a moment uh, in which all matter in the universe uh, exploded from a single point, creating all uh, that there is. For some Christians, if this were the case, uh, this, this is, in fact, a denial of the authority of the Scriptures, of what's recounted in, in the book of Genesis on how God created the world. And so the tension is felt once again. Now, I'll be honest with you and state that my personal faith in God does not depend on a literal reading of the book of Genesis. For other Christians, it does, uh, and, and that's okay. But in the last hundred years or so, the idea of creationism has been put forward, and this creationism is the idea that God created the world in a literal seven-day period, as recounted in the book of Genesis, and that God created the world at some point in the last 10,000 or so years. Uh, it's risky, in my view, to wager the entirety of our faith on a literal reading of Genesis. In the same way, it would be risky in the time of Galileo to wager your whole faith on the earth being at the center of the universe. So let's explore uh, Genesis. In the book of Genesis, uh, we have two creation stories. Genesis chapter 1 is the first creation story, and Genesis chapter 2 is the second. In the first creation story, we have a transcendent God who creates the world in, in seven days, step by step, and creates humanity at the end as a kind of culmination of creation. In Genesis chapter 2, God creates humanity first, places the first human being in a garden, and God is creative, improvisational, in seeking a companion for this lonely person, uh, and so then creates animals, and eventually a second person out of the, out, out of the rib of the first, uh, and these humans named Adam and Eve become partners. The 
differences in the creation stories are complementary uh, in that in one, God is transcendent and powerful. In the other, God is imminent, walking in the garden, talking with people. But what Genesis 1 and 2, uh, they, they aren't science textbooks. And I'll illustrate this with this diagram of how people in the ancient Near East understood the structure of the earth. In Genesis, it says that God created uh, a dome or a vault to separate the waters that are below from the waters that are above. And in the ancient Near East, people believed, they, they understood that the sky was a solid structure and that above the sky was waters, just as there were waters below the earth. And so this dome, this, this firmament, withheld the waters above. And in a subsequent day of creation, uh, God puts the sun and the moon and the stars on the vault. We recognize that we, because of the advancements in science, that this is not an accurate picture of the world. There is not, in fact, water above, uh, above us, and the sky is not a solid structure, and that the stars and the sun and the moon are beyond us, beyond our atmosphere, far away. And so, recognizing this, we see that Genesis chapter 1 and 2 are not written to teach us about science, but what they are is a confession of faith. A confession of faith that God is the Creator. In the ancient Near East, the creation stories that the Israelites would have been familiar with often included a battle between a god and a primordial sea monster. Because it was understood that uh, before creation there was water. Often the water uh, symbolized in a sea monster and so the creation of the world involved, it, it was necessary for, go, for God to defeat in battle the sea monster. And in the Babylonian creation story, it was the Babylonian god Marduk who killed the sea monster and created the land out of the body of the sea monster. And when the Israelites are in exile, they're seeing this story this theology paraded through the, through the streets every year because creation needs to be reenacted because it's always on the verge of, of, of collapse. What if there's a, 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 a crack in the, in the dome? This motif of, of defeating the sea monster, we see it in the scriptures as well in Psalm 74. And this is a confession of faith, too, in, in, in the power of Yahweh. It was, it was God who created. It was you who split open the sea by your power. You broke the heads of the monster in the water. It was you who crushed the heads of Leviathan. Leviathan being one of the, the sea monsters. But in Genesis chapter 1, and this is so incredible... Genesis chapter 1, there is no battle. There's no battle between God and the sea monster. And in fact, it says that God created the great sea monsters. And unfor unfortunately, some of our English translations, they, they, tr they translate it in such a way that we could think of it as whales or sharks. But it's actually talking about the leviathans the sea monsters, 
In Genesis, this is God created the sea monsters. And the sea monsters, they're just one of the, of the fish and all the other creatures that swim in the oceans. This is a profound claim of faith for any who hears it that God creates unopposed, that even the sea monsters, should they be real, were created by God. This is how we read the creation stories. For a people who heard over and over again about how the world came to be through a battle between one God and one sea monster, it's saying, no, the world came into being and it was good and it was peaceful and it was created by the power and the sovereignty of God who is a transcendent creator. When Christians speak of creation, there's a doctrine from Latin called creation ex nihilo, which translates creation out of nothing. Arises not only from the creation story, but also from verses like Psalm 33, where it says, by your word, the heavens were made from Romans, for him and through him and to him are all things. As human beings, we don't have the power to create something from nothing. And the grammar of the Old Testament uh, incorporates this theological uh, and reality. Because the word create is a word that only God can be the subject of. And so in the Old Testament, you will never hear the Hebrew word bara, which means to create. You'll never hear a, hear a human do that. Human beings can build, can assemble, can construct, but only God can create something from nothing. There's even a law in physics that states something like even uh, uh, that, that matter or energy cannot be created, it can only be transferred, because we don't have that power as human beings. Before modern times, our existence, our life, was always understood as a, as a participation in God. Our, our being comes to us as a gift, as a donation from God. The ancient Greeks understood this well, that for God to be God by definition, God must transcend nature and being. And that's why when Paul goes to Athens and he he sees how religious people are in Athens and how, how, how people are in, engaging the gods of, of wood and stone. And he says, I see your religiosity and what you are seeking, but the answer isn't found in these images, in these idols. It's found in the God who is the creator of the heavens and the earth. And he says, even as your own poets say, in him we live and move and have our being. When we speak of God creating from nothing, we are also speaking of the nature of God. As God existing, transcending, nature and creation itself, because God is the creator. But something shifted as the world uh, transitioned into modernity. And often people point to the ideas of, of a philosopher by the name of John 
SCOTUS. And what he proposed is that when we speak of God and we attribute characteristics to God, such as God is good or God is powerful, that God's goodness or God's power is the same as our goodness or our power, just more so. In other words, it's a difference of degree between God and us, not a difference in kind. Whereas in the pre-modern world, God's goodness or God's power was always understood as only by analogy to our goodness or any power that we have in the way that our ability to create and God's ability to create. It's not that God is just a better creator. It's that God can create in a way that we can't. God can create out of nothing. And so, if God becomes different only in kind, excuse me, only in degree, but not in kind, it seems like theological hair splitting, but how we understand God is critical. It's the most important word in the English language, God, and what we think of when we say that word, what comes to our mind. If God is only different from us in degree, a more powerful or a more sovereign version of us, then God does not transcend creation itself, being itself. It's sort of like asking, where, where does God learn wisdom? Where does God find love? Isaiah asked that question, where does God find wisdom? Uh, and the answer is, that's a silly question. Because wisdom and love come from God. They are not categories that exist above God and that transcend God. Just like existence itself is within God, a participation in God. And so as we shifted into the modern world, tragically, we tend to think more of God as a being alongside us. And the category of existence, of being itself, as more fundamental, as more transcendent than even God. But in fact, as rightly understood, God is the creator, the author, the artist, the source of all being. And we are creatures and characters of God. If we say then that God exists... We could also say that the music stand exists, or the book exists. It's the same word in English, but if we understand God, then it's a different meaning. Because our existence, the book's existence, is a contingent. We're created. God isn't created. God exists in a different way only by analogy, not by a difference of degree. This distinction between a God who transcends being and a God who is a being amongst other beings, it has everything to do with the relationship between science and faith. Because only if we believe in the smaller God, the being among other beings, only then do advances in science and understanding nature push God out of the picture. Think about uh, ourselves. 
we claim that we are created by God. But we also know that there were natural causes that occurred that resulted in us being here. We are each the result of, of the union of a sperm and an egg. And nobody disputes that. We hold these two explanations, these realities together. Because we understand that God is not a rival cause to the causes of nature. In the same way that if we said God created a book, we're not saying that God set up a print shop across the street from Friesen's and is printing books. Uh, when we speak of God's creation of us, it's not that God is somehow confined and must compete with the causes of nature. We're speaking of God, God's sovereignty over the whole process and reality of our being, of our being real. Because that's, that's what the big God is. That's what God being a creator means. And so if we think that a mathematical explanation or a physical explanation that explains something in creation or how the world came to be what it is, if that somehow pushes God out of the picture or that somehow makes belief in God not possible anymore because we can explain things by nature or physics and so forth, that's only a problem if we've misunderstood God. If we only consider God as a cause or a being among all the other causes or beings in nature. God transcends nature. Science is the study of creation. And so as such, science cannot determine whether God exists or not. Because God is not contained within nature. God is beyond the limits of science. And so for science to claim, it can make a determination uh, ab about God is to go too far as a scientist, to extend beyond the limits. And it is also a circular argument to say that anything science explains does not exist. And therefore, if science can't explain it, it doesn't exist. Think of uh, work of literature you read a great work of literature like Romeo and Juliet and you find that despite the conflicts between their families, Romeo and Juliet, they fell in love and, spoiler alert, they died. It was a tragedy and you find that uh, nowhere in the book did you hear about Shakespeare. And all this happened to Romeo and Juliet, so without Shakespeare, so obviously Shakespeare doesn't exist. We recognize that that is a logical error in failing to understand what it, an author is and what literature is. It's the same error in logic to conclude 
that because science can explain things, God doesn't exist. Because we've misunderstood God. Knowledge of God is attainable, just as knowledge is of the natural world, but knowledge of God arises through different means, through contemplation, through prayer, through study of the Word, through living a life of faith and community. And what's beautiful, as the creation stories of Genesis held together, what, what they teach us is that God's transcendence doesn't mean that God is impersonal. It doesn't mean that God is distant. When Paul observed in Athens that human inclination to reach for the transcendent, an inclination that often goes astray, he affirmed it. But he says you need to seek it in a transcendent creator, God, the maker of heaven and earth, known in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And this God, though, is not far off. This God is near. Because God's transcendence, that God is not confined to materiality. As we are as a book is, as a music stand is, means that God can also be present at all times, in all places, and within us. Because God is the creator. And so I hope I have convinced you that if we start with that all-important word, God, and understand God and the nature of God, that we will not dwell in fear of science as believers, but that we will embrace science and that we will seek to love God and to love our neighbor amidst our journeys in this world created by God. Amen. Join us in singing Loving Spirit.
Please join me now in prayer. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for snow. Thank you for the brilliance of a Canadian winter and the way snow changes our landscape, unifying it, showing us new shapes and contours, and blanket it, blanketing it all in white. Thank you for children who delight in snow, embracing building snowmans and tunnels and sliding down slopes. And thank you, God, for the way that snow interrupts our grown-up lives, slowing us down, even when we don't want to, and helping us to rely on each other. The snow is an invitation to experience peace, the peace of the world in winter. Jesus, help us live in peace. Peace with our loved ones, embracing tenderness and forgiveness, leaving behind bitterness and grudges. We also want to live in peace in Canada, finding ways to embrace all people, even those with whom we disagree or on different sides of issues. Help us reject completely racist and anti-Semitic actions and words, and help us find ways to work towards your peace. We also long for peace in Ukraine and Afghanistan and Ethiopia, rejecting aggression and bloodshed of soldiers and civilians, and embracing diplomacy and non-violent solutions. Oh Jesus, why is it so hard to live in peace. Spirit of hope, raise up leaders to be peacemakers in our world, especially in this time when we need peace on this planet Earth. We need to find ways to change our hurtful ways to restore balance and harmony. Show us how we can all be peacemakers by carefully nurturing love in our own hearts, with our neighbors, in our church community, and in our broader community, fostering respect and wisdom. You hear the concerns of our community, O oh God. We pray for those who are in the hospital, for Bernard, Lena, and Helen. And we pray for those who are ailing and those who are recovering. Grant them your spirit of comfort and hope. We pray for all those who are grieving the death of loved ones or lost because of strained and broken relationships. We pray for Rudy and Edna and also for Marv and Joyce, that you may go with them as they process their grief with their family and also as Marv and Joyce find ways to support their children and grandchildren. May this grief not overwhelm them, but help them turn to you and their community for support. We pray also for those who are celebrating this week, birthdays or anniversaries or relationships. May your love be, presence, be present and your presence celebrated. Spirit of love, infuse us with your generosity and kindness. Help us freely share of what you have given us, Help us willingly offer the gifts that we've been blessed with and guide our actions to imitate your love in all that we do. Bless the gifts that we share, the time that we share, and the finances we offer up to you. Oh God, let your peace fall upon us like snow, blanketing our world, covering a multitude of sins and disagreements restoring a sense of thankfulness and wonder that we are alive now, together. Amen. I invite you to please stand for the final song and the benediction. And now, as we go from this place, may we see God in and through the world, not confined to our world, but shining through the people and the creation that is around us. 
transcending our world. May we go from this place seeking out God's face and God's image, God's presence in all we encounter. May we go now in peace. Amen.